Okay, so here we are. Good afternoon and warm welcome uh, to everybody uh, this, uh, this afternoon, um, particularly our international attendees, our panelists and expert speakers to the first of our Inside Out webinar series. Uh, this is a new initiative of interactive webinars brought to you by Global Business Services, GBS, and its uh, partner, the well-known English language uh, news provider, Vietnam Insider. So uh, particularly in these COVID challenge time, our goal is to bring uh, actionable insights to our network of investors, business owners, and expatriates um, who are cons considering or already invested in Vietnam. So, uh, so this is uh, the purpose of our, our webinars. The agenda for today is quite tight. So, um, uh, and it includes these four terrific panelists uh, that you probably see on the screen. Uh, time permitting, uh, we'll also have um, question and answers. So uh, please use your Zoom to, uh, to log any questions that you have and, uh, and we'll attempt to get those if we have uh, sufficient time. So. Um, just running through the agenda quickly. Um, I'm Ron Wood, I'm the host of uh, today's session and um, uh, the next speaker and our second speaker is, is uh, extremely well qualified, uh, Oliver Schwarzhaupt. I hope I got that right, Oliver. Um, holds a master degree in economics with majors in finance, capital markets and econometrics, well, that's statistics for non-economists. And is the chief risk officer of Maritime Bank based in Hanoi. Um, he has more than 25 years experience in international banking and risk management and a long track record in implementing best practice risk management and meeting the re regulatory requirements uh, of developed and emerging markets, having worked for many European, Middle Eastern and Asian financial institutions. Um, before Maritime Bank, Oliver was Chief Risk Officer, Chief risk officer at Kaliji Bank in Qatar and Chief Risk Officer at Maritime Bank previously as well in an earlier uh, period and a Deputy Chief Risk Officer come Head of Risk at the Emirates Bank MBD in United Arab, Arab Emirates and Commerce Bank in Germany where he headed the rating method system. So that's a bit of an introduction to Oliver um, who's going to be focused on the data management in COVID conditions but also talking about the banking aspects to um, credit management. So thank you for joining Oliver. I know uh, uh, it's quite a bit of, uh, even if it's 10 minutes or 15 minutes, there's quite a lot of preparation involved. So take it away, please, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ron, for having me. And uh, it's good that you mentioned that it's the second time that I'm here in Vietnam. The first time I was with MSB between 2010 and 2012. Now I've come back um, um, last year, and it's good to be able to support MSB and the banking industry while being here. Uh, you mentioned also that um, I have uh, statistics, I have studied statistics, econometrics. This is true. Therefore, it's also good to see that Richard um, has published and let us know all the statistics about GDP and uh, etc. And um, what I wanted to talk about is the, um, what's really happening in the bank, what's really happening in MSB and the main questions are how can we on the one hand support our customers but on the other hand we have to make sure that we are doing this in the best interest uh, of the bank. One big question is and the answer I think is clear, it's a rhetoric question, does COVID have influence on the credibility of customers do we see customers with financial difficulties? And the answer is clearly yes, we do see that. Um, many customers um, have a, can see a decrease in uh, their income and um, how we are uh, dealing with uh, these customers. What are these customers doing when it comes to collection? And um, the title is debt management. So I'm talking a little bit about collection. I'm also talking about, let's say, um, SME or uh, corporate customers. Uh, customers are trying to delay their payments, uh, for example. And when um, collectors are trying to um, call them, they're not picking up the calls, uh, for example. Um, 
So what are we doing as a bank? Of course, we cannot let uh, them not pay. So we have to be uh, flexible in a way. We are not calling only once or twice these customers. We are calling them maybe three or four times. Um, we will uh, need to know if these customers are willing to pay or are they not willing to pay. So again, if uh, these customers are willing to pay, I think the bank here in Vietnam has the responsibility to support these customers. So we need to come to agreements that maybe the principals are not being paid directly, but uh, we will schedule it, for example, for a couple of months. And Richard has uh, mentioned it, the tourism industry, which uh, has been really uh, suffering. And uh, maybe you guys know some of the five-star hotels here in, in, in Hanoi. Um, they have sent people home, but what they did quite cleverly, they have sent people home, let's say for four or six months, giving them a minimum salary so they can survive, but also with the option to come back after six months. So it would be, um, in my opinion, not correct to penalize these customers, retail customers who have taken maybe credit card or, or a home loan and uh, directly force them into default. We have a um, responsibility as a bank. And at the end, when we are supporting these customers, we are supporting the economy as well. So <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is that um, flexibility in our reactions is probably key. Um, this uh, comes to tailor calling, this comes to field collection as well. And uh, we have to deal case, I wouldn't say case by case, but because these are clusters of cases. And uh, so we are going ahead uh, with that. Um, on the corporate or SME side, is the same. We can see that there are difficulties. From a portfolio point of view, for us as a bank, it's not significant. But uh, the central bank has given the opportunity for all the banks to uh, reschedule, um, to be in touch with the customers and find the best way so they can pay back. Um, this is the reason why we don't see um, an increase in NPLs. We see an increase in distress customers on both sides, retail and corporates, but we don't see an increase maybe marginally in, in NPL um, ratios, which is great, which is great for us as a bank, which is great for the economy um, as well. How we are dealing with the bank's own portfolio and how we are dealing with our main shareholders or the, let's say, the board or how we are doing this. Um, we have established a um, reporting mechanism at least on a monthly basis where we are giving a full overview on these portfolios, um, industry specific, coming back what uh, Richard said previously. And of course, we are analyzing what could happen in the future. Do we need to adjust uh, our budgets for the bank? Do we need to adjust provision figures for the bank? Um, how we are planning all these uh, things. So we are doing that on a monthly basis and reporting directly to EXCO and also to the board uh, risk committee. What I'm trying to say is that we have to deal uh, with two sides. One is the customer side on the one hand, the other one, of course, with the shareholder side um, in the bank, which is definitely a big uh, issue during uh, these times. But until now, I think we have managed that quite well. So that's maybe a kind of introduction from my side. Okay, thank you, Oliver. So is that uh, that's your opening comments? Are you um, happy to take a question? I, I've got one question that we can deal with. Uh, it's directed to you, actually. Um, uh, about 
taking action about a customer, a trade customer um, that hasn't paid for an existing trade receivable. Have you got any, I mean, again, from a banker's point of view, it's generally customer to customer, but uh, um, we've, we've got one question uh, that you can probably see if you go to the Q&A box, but uh, what is the legal recourse on a customer in a trade if a customer in Vietnam doesn't pay for an existing trade receivable? Any, I think any we thoughts ask, about that? We should ask the lawyer about that. Ask Kathleen, okay. So we might, we might let her do a talking before, uh, uh, before we get to that one, but we've got, uh, uh, that's definitely one of the questions that's come up. Um, but yeah, one of the comments is, uh, one of the other questions, which is how long can Vietnam uh, keep its borders closed um, given you know, the impact on tourism and FDI, you know, when people can't visit, they can't invest as easily. And uh, that's obviously really important to a developing market like Vietnam. So uh, for any of our panelists, welcome to comment about that particular question. I, I won't name the, the, uh, the question up, but uh, one of our viewers has asked that question, how long can Vietnam keep its borders shut like this? Because it, it obviously has more effect on a developing market than a than even uh, the very wealthy markets that aren't so dependent on FDI. So, any comments about that? I, I think it's an easy and difficult question at, at the same time. Until now, I think the Vietnamese government has very intelligently dealt with the whole situation. And uh, sometimes I'm telling my friends in Germany, I'm, I feel more secure here in Hanoi than I would feel, for example, in Berlin or in Frankfurt. So I think we have, uh, since we are now in October and uh, the world is hoping that there will be a vaccine uh, very soon, this, is the, this will be the main ball game in the entire world. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing is I think the government has already made some relaxations for experts, uh, diplomats anyway, and for others to come into the country, um, but still strictly trying to contain the disease. Um, so if, this, if we don't have a second um, or third uh, outbreak, I see that uh, in the next two or three months, we can further relax and bring the economy uh, back. But there are so many buts and so many things we, we really don't know. Um, so if we have a webinar after two or three months, we can probably answer this question. And um, that would be my thoughts.